Welcome everyone to the first online seminar for the Conflict Community of Practice, focusing on participatory conflict analysis. My name is Oliver Chevron and I'm based as a conflict advisor at CIUK. We're in the process of trying out a few ways to experiment with sharing knowledge and best practice, and we're keen to hear your feedback on how this works for you and any other suggestions you have for future topics. In terms of today's presentation, we're going to discuss a few key themes relating to participatory conflict analysis. For some of you, these themes will be very familiar. However, it might be helpful to quickly run through those for those that are new to this field. Firstly, we're going to think through some of the fundamental concepts of peace, conflict and violence. Secondly, we're going to have a quick reflection on why doing a conflict analysis might be helpful. And thirdly, we're going to spend the majority of the session running through three types of participatory analysis. So before we think about analysis itself, what do we think conflict means? Most people will consider conflict as a negative concept, probably associating it with violence and war. However, a peace researcher, Johan Galtung, challenged this understanding and asked, asked us to consider these concepts separately. Galton asks us to view conflict as the engine of social change, which if managed well can help us progress. Generally, those working in the peace field have nothing against conflict itself. They see this as a natural and healthy component of any society. Indeed, much of contemporary conflict transformation is about building structures which help conflicts to be resolved peacefully. So if we understand conflict, what do we mean by violence? Again, most people would probably consider violence in a very narrow sense. However, Galton asks us to consider three types of violence, direct, structural, and cultural. Direct violence relates to our more conventional understanding of the term, killing mainly of people of property, whereas structural violence relates to violence conducted through systems, perhaps most powerfully seen when one particular group is discriminated against. Cultural violence relates to those social norms that help us justify violence carried out against one particular group in certain situations. So if we understand conflict and violence, peace. Again, Galton offers us a couple of nuances to the common understanding of the word. Negative peace refer refers to the absence of war, which whilst providing some level of security, might still live as living under a brutal dictatorship. Positive peace the absence of war and the absence of structural violence is a society in which structures exist for conflicts to be resolved without recourse to violence. So with these fundamental concepts in mind, let's turn our attention to conflict analysis. Why do we need to do a conflict analysis? Firstly, conflict analysis is essential for helping us to think about how our programs can best function in the context, i.e. how can they be more conflict sensitive, and secondly, on the context, i.e. how can our programmes contribute to peace building. Secondly, participatory conflict analysis, if used as an intervention itself, can be used to help parties or victims of violent conflict understand the context better. It can also be used to help parties reflect on how others may perceive the conflict differently. Third, understanding your conflict is the first step of how to make your programmes more conflict sensitive. Once you understand your conflict, you can understand how your program interacts with the context and vice versa, and makes changes to your program that either minimise negative adverse effects or maximise positive ones. So today we're going to think about three frequently used models of participatory conflict analysis and how they might be useful to your work. As you will see, the outer layer of this blue circle represents the overall context of a particular country or region. We can break this down by thinking about the overall history or profile through a pre peace and conflict timeline. The stakeholders in a context through actor mapping and the underlying drivers of conflict relating to the causes that drive a particular context. Now we've had a look through these three different types of participatory analysis, let's through, think through each of these exercises in turn. OK, for all of the participatory conflict analysis exercises that we're going to do today, you'll need flip charts and pens. If you're going to do the stakeholder mapping, you'll need blue tack, scissors and coloured paper. If you're doing this by yourself or you do not know the context well, you may want to read some recent reports on the context so you know, understand the history and issues better. Ideally, however, you'll be doing this with a knowledgeable group of people who know the context well.
If possible, try to organize a group with a good range of experience. However, remember, sometimes it may not be appropriate to run these exercises jointly with people from very different perspectives, especially if they've not worked together before. You may want to set up separate sessions instead. Okay, so let's look at the first exercise, in conflict timeline. Firstly, in your flip chart, you need to draw some axes, one for time and one for levels of conflict. Depending on the context you're in, you have to think about what time frame makes sense for you, whether you want to take the last year or the last 20 years, although you probably don't want to go too far back. In terms of levels of violence, you can either leave this quite vague as a measure of your perceptions of violence over time, or you could choose a specific conflict indicator if you have a sense of or the actual data to hand. Next, you'll need to start plotting your data and drawing a line of best fit across that data set. So as you can see from this line, we can now mark out key trends in this particular conflict. Here, for example, is the crisis point. And here is the relative cessation of hostilities. Here's an escalation and de-escalation. And sometimes when completing this exercise, you'll notice patterns in the data. Here, for example, we can see regular peaks of conflict at regular time intervals. This could suggest, for example, that conflict is triggered by particular events festivals, seasons, and elections. So that's the timeline. One last tip, however, is remember that when you complete your timeline, it's unlikely that the conflict is going to start at zero. Also, it might be worth considering that just because you see an upward or downward trend for one particular conflict indicator, another may indicate the opposite. So that's the first exercise. Let's have a look now at actor Actor mapping helps us to determine which groups are influential or are affected by the conflict. It's important to consider a broad group of actors, not just those directly affected by the conflict, as they may still have impacts on the dynamics of the conflict that we've not previously considered. Firstly, write a list of the major actors and then using the coloured paper, cut out circles that represent each of these. The size of the circle should represent the relative power of that particular group. Although remember that sometimes quite small groups might have a considerable influence and vice versa. Normally, when people complete this exercise, they don't identify individuals as specific actors, but rather groups. You can use the blue tack to secure these to the flip chart, and, and this will help you to move them around as you're completing the exercise or if you come back to revise it later. So now we can begin mapping the specific relationships. Here, for example, a straight line between two actors represents a positive relationship. A double line would represent a strong alliance. A line with an arrow shows the direction of influence. A dotted line represents an unknown relationship. This would represent a broken relationship. And finally, here's a relationship in conflict. However, in most cases, it's unlikely that the actor groups you have chosen are completely homogenous, being comprised themselves of particular groupings and factions. This can be shown by a line through that actor. This, this will then allow you to mark out the different relations actors may have with the same party. So here's a mapping of the actors in this particular context, but we've missed something crucial here. Where's care? Even if the CEO is not currently working on conflict issues, your very presence will have an impact on the context, and it's likely that care will have relationships with several of the major actors in any given setting. Thinking about what relationships CARE has and ones it might be able to create in the future will be helpful in designing programs that work on or in conflict. Lastly, this version of the context of the course is, is of course subjective and was built upon the perceptions of those who created the mapping. This call can be used to compare and contrast particular perceptions of who the key relationships are in different communities. Okay, so let's move on to our last exercise that addresses the underlying causes and drivers of conflict. To help us think through this, we're going to use the metaphor of an iceberg. What we can see above the iceberg is the visual impact of a conflict. This could be the impact of war or the result of a more community level conflict. Beneath the iceberg are the various drivers of the conflict. The deeper you go, the more historically entrenched these are in that particular setting. At sea level, we can think of the particular short-term triggers that might transform latent conflict into something which is more overt. So looking again at the deeper levels, we can divide this into proximate triggers, and these would be trends that are not directly attributable to a particular instance of violence, but are a broader contributing factor. And then there are the 
Then there are the deeper driving factors of a conflict, most likely from recent historical um, grievances. And then finally, really deep, entrenched historical grievances or cultural norms that shape the broader discourse of a particular conflict. Once you've completed all the levels, you might want to consider whether you can link any of them together. Can you make connections between different drivers and how these might result in the visible impacts of the conflict we can see at the top? Lastly, it's useful to think about at which level care is best placed to work with if we want to address these underlying drivers of conflict. Working on the very deep levels is likely to take a long time and require resources to reshape national discourse whilst working to prevent the instance of certain triggers may not meet the need for long-term sustainable conflict transformation. Okay, so that's it for today. Just to recap, we've had to think through some of the key concepts regarding peace, conflict and violence, considered why conflict analysis might be important to our work, and run through three participatory analysis models. If you do have any questions or thoughts on this presentation, then please do keep in touch.